Nepal is one of, if not the most, mountainous country on earth. It's home to our tallest peak, Mount Everest, which it shares along with China. While the third tallest mountain on earth, Kanchenjunga, is split between Nepal and India, despite being stuck and even sharing mountains with two of the world's consistently largest population centers, the Kingdom of Nepal has managed to stay unconquered and uncolonized by outside powers since its formation in 1768. With the shield provided by the Himalayan mountain range, the Nepalese have used their terrain to stave off any would-be subjugators. This observation leaves us with a few questions, namely, how could any army conquer such a harsh land as this? And who created and unified Nepal into the country that we know today? All this and more will be answered as we examine the life of Prithvi Narayan Chaha, the father of Nepal. Even before the birth of this great unifier, his life was endangered by his own eagerness to enter this world. His mother, a woman of noble birth named Kaushalyavati, was the second and favorite wife of King of Gurkha, a man named Narabhupal Shaha. The Kingdom of Gurkha sat precariously in the middle of 54 constantly warring minor Nepalese kingdoms. In many cases, especially in central Nepal, there was a kingdom for every mountain and every valley. From the outside, Gorkha was just another petty kingdom in hills of turmoil and division. At the age of five, Prithvi Narayan Shaha would begin his education. This task fell to the two court astrologers at the Gorkha royal palace. These two gurus tutored the young prince in reading, writing, mathematics, history and astrology the latter of which was the subject of utmost cultural importance to the Nepalese as being able to read the stars provided valuable insight on day-to-day -day matters, harvest seasons and even warfare. In conjunction with his worldly education, Prithvi was also raised as a follower of Hinduism. The kings and the kingdoms of Gorkha were one of the northernmost lands that followed the many gods of Hinduism that are closely associated with Nepal's southern neighbour, India. This is an important note to make, as the 54 Hindu kingdoms of Nepal were cut off from the rest of the Hindu world by the Muslim Mughal Empire. This foreign empire had established a strong foothold in northern India for the past century and conquered nearly all of the subcontinent by the time Prithvi was born. The other two neighbours of these 54 split Nepalese kingdoms included the semi-autonomous Tibet to the north, which had recently fallen to another foreign power, this one being the Chinese Qing dynasty. The final and perhaps most ambitious neighbour of Nepal was another foreign invader to the southeast in what is now modern-day Bengal. Here, the conqueror was none other than the British East India Company. One day, all of India, Pakistan and Bengal would become the crown jewel of the British Empire. But for now, the sea-based empire had started its conquest by threatening the many waterways of the Bengal Delta, including the mighty Ganges River. After securing these vital rivers and tributaries, the British appointed local puppet rulers that would be forced to pay monthly tribute to the British East India Company. Pinned between three of the largest empires on earth, the unification of Nepal was a necessity of life for these split kingdoms more than anything else. Prithvi Narayan Shaha would have been educated on the delicate political situation that the Kingdom of Gorkha had found itself in, the same situation he would one day need to navigate as king. Whilst growing up, Prithvi, on the orders of his mother, was instructed and forced not to indulge himself in any worldly pleasures or vices. This was done to empower the prince and build within him a laser-focused and fully grounded sense of duty as a king with no ulterior desires. 
As Prithvi grew from a boy into a teen, his education shifted along with him. On top of his primary studies, he also began learning about military strategy and Kukri swordsmanship. The Kukri is the infamous curved dagger of the Gorkha that is still used to this day. The Kukri acted as a military multi-tool along the same lines as an axe. The 18-inch blade could be used for digging, chopping wood, skinning an animal and of course killing an adversary. By the time Prithvi was 14, he was already being married off to the daughter of the nearby king of Makwampur. His 13-year-old bride was named Indra Kumari and with time the two would come to make a great match. The marriage went off without a hitch. This is until the after party. An argument broke out between the new in-laws and eventually Indra Kumari was taken back to Makwampur by her father. Prithvi would go home married, although without a bride accompanying him. The king of Makwampur only agreed to fully give his daughter's hand away when Prithvi inherited the kingship of Gorka from his father. After this confusing and slightly failed marriage, Prithvi would return to his princely training. The reason for this post-marital conflict may have arisen from the ambitions of Prithvi's father, King Narambupal Shah. In 1737, after the halfway failed marriage, Narambupal declared war on the kingdom of Kathmandu and claimed the territory and the city of Nuwakot as his own. Named after their capital and the modern-day capital of Nepal, the Kingdom of Kathmandu managed to fight off the Gorkha invasion, pushing Narumbapal back to the domains of his own kingdom. After watching his father's campaign turn into humiliation, Prince Prithvi made a life goal to complete what his father could not. He would only need to wait six years to fulfill this self-made prophecy, as Narumbapal Shah would die on the April 3rd, of 1743 at the age of 46. This would leave Prithvi Narayan Shah to be formally crowned as the King of Gorkha on the same day at 20 years old. With this inherited title, he was also reunited with his wife Indra Kumari of Makwampur. He then set his eyes on annexing the region of Nuwakot. Before he could start in this endeavour, he named Shivaram Singh Basnyat to be the chief commander of Gorkha's military. Shivaram was a Gorkha noble that Prithvi Narayan Shah had entrusted the conquest of Nuwakot with. Prithvi wanted to christen his reign with a successful military campaign, conquest of the region that his father had claimed. What he got was more similar to his own father's failed invasion only six years ago. This was a humiliation, but Prithvi would return to the drawing board to see how he could defeat the stubborn kingdom of Kathmandu. His solution required the adoption of two very important things, friends and a lot of gunpowder. First, to secure his western flank, Prithvi made an alliance with three other nearby kingdoms. From north to south, he aligned himself with the king of Lanjung, his father's old friend the king of Tanahun, and the king of Palpa, who ruled one of the largest kingdoms in the region. With Makwampur already pacified through his first marriage, Prithvi had only the king of Kathmandu, Jaya Prakash Mala, to worry about. To fulfill the second part of his plan, Prithvi intended to modernize his army by purchasing loads of gunpowder. The closest city to do that in was to the south, in the control of the Mughal Empire, an old jewel of a city in North India, Varanasi. In Varanasi, Prithvi Narayan Shah entered into his second marriage with Narendra Singh, the daughter of Rajput of Varanasi, a man named Abhiman Singh. With the alliance secured, Prithvi purchased many barrels of gunpowder firearms, heavy artillery 
and most importantly military advisors to drill his soldiers and instruct and train Prithvi in the art of ever modernizing 18th century warfare. With new tools and gunpowder to fill them, Prithvi returned to Gorka. The next thing he did could have been the defining decision of his entire reign. The king of Gorka allowed for anyone from any strata of life to join the military. In Indian culture, the caste system was only disrupted in times of dire emergency, but now untouchables could fight along the side of commoners, merchants, the established warrior class and even the revered Brahmin. This choice made sense as soldiers carrying guns and towering cannons could be trained far easier and in less time than ever before. This also allowed for an all-encompassing army of Prithvi Narayan Shahar to swell in size. He was ready to strike at Nuwakot again, this time with a modernized force of 1,500 kukri-wielding, cannon-firing musketmen. Prithvi, as any wise king would, waited for the stars to fully align in his favor before making his move on Nuwakot. The infamous priest and court astrologer Kulanada Dakal informed the king on the September of 26, telling him the precise time to begin the attack. Before launching his assault, his priests hammered nails into the soil of Nuwakot to ensure their victory. Prithvi Narayan Shaha then split his army into three different contingents to attack their goal, the fortress of Mahamandal, from three different angles. Prithvi would attack Mahamandal from the most unexpected southern side of the fortress. Prithvi's brother, Prince Mahodaman Kirti Shaha, would attack Mahamandal's western gate. The third army was led by a Gorkil noble named Kalu Pandey. He would strike the fortress's mountainous northern wall along with Prithvi's other brother, Prince Dal Mardan Shaha. Defending the fort was Sankhamani Rana, the son of a former Gurkil general named Jayant Rana, who had turned coat to the kingdom of Kathmandu after Prithvi's first defeat at their hands. As if the capture of Nuwakot wasn't already a matter of personal vengeance, this added another layer of emotion to the situation. General Kalu Pandey began the assault by scaling the northern cliffs of Mahamandal at night. Without being seen, he managed to gather his army on a cliff face before scaling the walls of the fortress. His sneak attack was so effective that the sleeping defenders of Mahamandal could barely even muster a counter-attack. Sankhamani Rana, the commanding officer, fought bravely before being surrounded by Gurkha soldiers. Wounded and desperate, Sankhamani Raha challenged Prithvi's brother Dal Mardan Shaha to a duel. The 20-year-old prince accepts. After a short exchange, Dal Mardan Shaha emerges victorious after chopping the head from Sankhamani Rana's body. By the time his brother, Prince Mahodaman Kirti Shaha, arrived in the fortress, it was all but won by Kalu Pandey and his own brother's hands. Prithvi Narayan Shaha was about to begin his very own assault on Mahamandal when a messenger arrived at his feet stating that the fortress was already taken. Surprised but not yet fulfilled, the king decided the time was right to march on the city of Nuwakot itself. The grand city was one of the gateways to Nepal's most prosperous lands, the valley of Kathmandu. On the 1st of October, the fort fell quickly to Prithvi their defenders running to the last remaining nearby fort. This last stronghold in the region of Nuwakot was Belkot Fortress and was currently under the command of Jayant Rana. The father of the beheaded Sankhamani Rana and betrayer of Prithvi Narayan Shaha. The siege of Belkot would begin in the early October and would last only a few days before Jayant Rana surrendered to his former king. In that time, the defenders of Belkot took as many as were taken, killing 50 Gorkhas in their defense. With this Pyrrhic victory, Prithvi Narayan Shaha had just finished what his father and even himself could not complete, the conquest of Nuwakot. 
as the imprisoned Jayant Rana was paraded through the streets of Nuwakot city, he was probably thinking back to the letter that Prithvi had written to him before launching the conquest of Nuwakot. In the letter, Prithvi asked for Jayant Rana to betray the king of Kathmandu as he had betrayed Gorka. Jayant Rana had written back, rejecting the king's proposal. He was then marched until reaching the Grand Palace of Nuwakot, his fate trailing behind as here, in the view of Prithvi's new subjects, the populace of Nuwakot was shown what happened to traitors of Gorka. Jayantrana was then skinned alive. This was done as Prithvi Narayan Shaha was betrayed again. On the other side of Gorka, his father's old friend, the allied king of Tanahun, launched his own attack on Gorka. The king of Tanahun had preemptively guessed that Prithvi would be defeated again at Nuwakot. He was wrong, and now the young king of Gorka was coming for him. Prithvi turned his army around and pushed back the invading force of Tanahun. Prithvi then invades Tanahun in his own turn. In a short month, he annexes the kingdom and captures the king of Tanahun, imprisoning him for the rest of his life. In a two-for-one deal, Prithvi Narayan Shaha had just doubled the domain of Gorka. In the next year, he would be forced to protect these gains. The king of Kathmandu, Jayaprakash Mala, gathered an army and hired a new general to dislodge the Gorka from Nuwakot. Commanding the defense of Nuwakot was the chief commander of Gorka's army, the aged Shivaram Singh Basnyat. Despite his age, he marched to meet the army of Kathmandu. At the ensuing battle of Sangha Chok, the Gorkha were defeated, with Shiravam Singh Basnyat perishing in the combat. After the lost battle, Gorkha reinforcements arrived in the area and drove back the armies of Kathmandu. This loss left Prithvi Narayan Shaha without a wise counsel of Shivaram Singh Basnyat a man that the king had known since he was a boy. It also left an empty spot at the head of his military, in need of filling. Who better for the job than the hero of Mahamandal fortress, Kalu Pandey? Together, the pair plotted on their next target for a whole decade before their military action. In this time, the kingdom of Gorka was largely at peace, as Prithvi replenished his manpower and resupplied the stores of gunpowder. This was only the calm before the storm that would unify all of Nepal. The next target was not the already beaten kingdom of Kathmandu, as one might expect, but their southern neighbour, the kingdom of Patan. In 1757, a Gokali army under the leadership of Kalu Pandey and Prithvi Narayan Shaha invades Patan. While attempting to occupy a town near their border, Kalu Pandey and the king are ambushed by enemy forces. Under the leadership of a Patani noble, Kalu Pandey is killed while assaulting the border town. The Gokali army begins to run while the Patanis chase the retreating men. Prithvi, with his army now on a full-scale route, dresses himself in the robes of a wanderer and pretends himself to be a travelling holy man to evade capture. Prithvi barely escapes back to Gorka. Nearly half of his army could not say the same. A serious defeat, the ten years of planning had gone to waste and there was the death of Akalu Pandey to top it off. Prithvi went back to the drawing board appointing the son of his previous lead commander to replace Kalu Pandey. His name was Abhiman Singh Basnyat, and he would lead Gorkha's armies even after the death of King Prithvi Narayan Shaha. Alongside to help this young head commander was the various brothers of Prithvi, who all seemed to be competent soldiers alike. In 1763, a plan was developed to fully surround the lush Kathmandu Valley that the kingdoms of Patan, Kathmandu and Bhaktapur rested in. Then, after surrounding and cutting off the trade of these three kingdoms, he would starve out the most prosperous region in Nepal. The plan seemed sound, but required Prithvi to commit his own brand of betrayal. 
to surround the Kathmandu Valley, he would need to invade the kingdom of Makwampur, a feat that could only be accomplished by fighting the brother of his first wife. Prithvi and his brothers commanded the armies as they overran Makwampur. The Gorkha encircled their first enemy, that King Digbardan Sen could muster with the king only narrowly escaping. The king of Makwampur retreated to the mountain pass fort of Hariharpur that could block the Kathmandu Valley to the south. Prithvi and the army of Gorkha defeat the king again and take Hariharpur. The kingdom of Makwampur was now firmly in Gorkha's hands. The retreating king, with nowhere left in his own lands to run, sought help from the nearby ruler of Bengal. Mir Kasim, the Nawab of Bengal, was the British East India Company's appointed puppet ruler in the region. When the king of Makwampur professed and told Mir Kasim of Prithvi's invasion, he decided to lend a hand. He sent a force of three and a half thousand Muslim Bengali soldiers in an attempt to dislodge the expansionist king of Gorkha. On January 20th of 1763, an army led by Gurgin Khan of Bengal was attacked and routed by the Shah brother-led army of Gorkha. Not long after this battle, Mir Qasim would be overthrown by the British East India Company. Prithvi was now the first Gokali king to defeat a non-Hindu country in battle, and he beat one that was supplied by the British Empire. In the same year, Prithvi and his armies ventured to the mountainous north of the Kathmandu Valley. The extreme peaks in this region meant that there was no established hereditary monarchy that ruled more than just a few hilltops, making this occupation far easier in cutting off the Kathmandu Valley from their lucrative trade with Tibet. Going east still, Prithvi's army takes the kingdom of Dolakha. The Kathmandu Valley was now completely cut off from the rest of the world. The mountains that once protected this fertile land were made its own prison. A blockade on a tremendous scale had just begun. The Gorkhas blocked all trade and hanged any blockade runners from trees. The three valley kings appeared in a hopeless spot. King Prithvi, as seems to be a theme, decided to press his advantage, perhaps a little too far. Sending his brother, Prince Surpratap Shahar, Prithvi orders for the capture of Patan. The undersupplied men still remained on guard as the Gorkha began a siege of Patan. After multiple assaults, the Gorkha were driven back from the walls each attempt they made. In the last assault, Surpratap Shahar is shot in the eye by an enemy arrow. Miraculously, after losing his eye, the prince had survived the wound. For the second time, Prithvi had been defeated by the men of Patan. The king then returned to his blockade. He could be patient with his conquest as it was he who was now in control of what came in and out of the mighty Kathmandu Valley. Prithvi starved the three kingdoms out for the following three years until 1767. In this year, he sent his army under his now one-eyed Prince Surpratap Shahar to the walls of Patan. In hopes of redeeming his previously failed attempt and with ten more years of experience since the first assault of Patan that resulted in the death of Kalu Pandey, the third siege of Patan began. Fearing that Patan was to fall, the king of the city sent word to his neighboring valley kings. These three monarchs, once rivals, were forced together by the mighty Prithvi Narayan Shahar and banded an army together strong enough to compete with Gokhali might. Surpratap Shahar defeated the coalition army with relative ease. For the three kings of Kathmandu Valley, this defeat was their last chance at not becoming conquered by Gokha. Demoralized nobles from these three kingdoms began defecting to Prithvi Narayan Shahar, among them being the same commander that had defeated and as a result killed Kalu Pandey all those years ago. This general opened the gates of Patan to the men of Gorkha. The king of Patan would manage to retreat to the kingdom of Pakhtampur before his capture. 
to punish Bhutan for its decade of resistance and to disfigure the city that had disfigured his own brother, Prithvi Narayan Shah ordered for all of the ears and noses of every inhabitant inside to be cut off. On that day, thousands of men, women and children were cut by the kukri of the Gorkha. In the aftermath, Prithvi Narayan Shah would not outright annex Bhutan, but instead offered kingship to his loyal brother, the victor of the duel of Mahamandal, Dal Mardan Shah. Finally, after years of attempts, Prithvi had started his conquest of Kathmandu Valley. He had his first victory and only two kingdoms remained. His next target would be the former owner of Nuwakot, Jayaprakash Mala, in the city of Kathmandu itself. Jayaprakash Mala was no fool, however, and knew the king of Gorkha could not be defeated by him and his Bhaktapur ally. He wrote to the British East India Company, informing the British of the fate of Patan and pleading for assistance. The British, in turn, wrote to Prithvi Narayan Shah and ordered him to cease his blockade of the valley. Prithvi Narayan Shah didn't even write back. This forced the British to send an expeditionary force north to inspect the situation. Led by Captain George Kinlock, the expedition reached the fort of Sindhuli on November 6th of 1767. Sindhuli rested only 47 miles away from the city of Kathmandu. The British attacked the few Gorkha stationed inside the small fort of Sindhuli, but they were initially repulsed under heavy fire. After regrouping, Captain Kinlock launched another assault on this fort, this one finding more success as they took Sindhuli with minimal casualties. Far from their supply lines in Bengal, the British were promised plenty of food from Jaya Prakash Mala once reaching Sindhuli. The supplies were nowhere to be found as the King of Kathmandu had barely enough food for his own people. After waiting for resupply for a few days to no avail, Captain Kinloch returned to Bengal. Prithvi Narayan Shah had just ignored the British Empire and it appeared by means of blockade he had won. The battle for Kathmandu city began on the night of September 25th of 1768. The attacking Gorkha split their army into three. One of the forces was to be commanded by the experienced brother of King Prithvi, Prince Surpratap Shah. The other two contingents were to be led by the sons of Kalu Pandey, who had followed their family's military tradition. Once the Gorkhali began scaling the walls, the nobles of Jaya Prakash Mala began to take the side of Prithvi. After a short defense and the surrender of many, the city of Kathmandu falls to Prithvi Narayan Shah. Jaya Prakash Mala would retreat with a few loyal men to the city of the Six Pradans, Lalitpur. After the quick battle for the city, many citizens of Kathmandu awoke without even knowing what had happened. They were quickly informed as Prithvi Narayan Shah led a victory parade through the streets of Kathmandu. It is here in front of his army and the citizens of Kathmandu that the kingdom of Gorkha became the kingdom of Nepal. King Prithvi Narayan Shah of Nepal then named Kathmandu as his new capital city. Like the country that he had created, Kathmandu still stands as the capital of Nepal to this very day. During his coronation, celebratory gunshots were fired into the air. One gun malfunctioned and killed a son of the late Kalu Pandey, dampening the atmosphere of an otherwise joyous day. The city of Lalitpur, formerly under the control of Patan, was ruled over by a council of six men called the Pradhans. This was a long-standing tradition that Prithvi was here to disrupt. After a long siege and a few failed assaults, Prithvi decided to make a deal with the non-Pradhan nobles of the city, as it was them who had turned over the Kathmandu Valley to him up until this point. After successfully coming to a deal with a clique of Lalitpur nobility, Prithvi orders for an assault led by his one-eyed brother, Surpratap Shah. The city then falls without a fight to an army of 20,000 Nepalese. Again, Jaya Prakash Mala retreated, 
this time falling back to the last holdout city, Bahatpur, joining the king of Patan. As for the six ruling Pradhans, they would be treated respectfully by King Prithvi. That is, until he changed his mind and ordered them all to be killed and for their bodies to be dumped in a nearby river. Only one city stood between Prithvi Narayan Shah and the complete annexation of the prosperous Kathmandu Valley, Bakatpur. The city was now home to the three once mighty valley kings. The siege began. The nobles, tired of blockade and war, betrayed the three kings and opened the gates of Bakatpur on the night of 25th of November of 1769. Little did they know the repercussions. The Nepalese army entered and in the final show of dominance looted and burned Bakatpur, killing 2,000 civilians and burning at least 500 houses to the ground. Finally, the three kings of Kathmandu Valley were all cornered with nowhere left to go. Jayaprakash Mala, the longest standing rival of Prithvi Narayan Shah, was killed by a bullet whilst fighting in the defence of the city. The king of Patan was brought to him in chains, wherein he would remain a hostage for the rest of his days. For the king of Bakatpur, Prithvi Narayan Shah, had a rare sympathy for the 66-year-old Ranajit Mala. The final king of Bakatpur was then exiled from the newly created kingdom of Nepal. In sorrowful retribution, Ranajit Mala composes what would become a popular Nepalese folk song expressing his melancholy last look at his homeland of the Kathmandu Valley. The near 15-year-long plan to conquer the Kathmandu Valley and create the unified kingdom of Nepal was now complete. The price Prithvi paid was steep and included Kalu Pandey, one of his sons, countless men and the eye of his brother who led much of the campaign, Prince Surpratap Shah. The cost, though heavy, was worth it, as he had just laid the foundational block to a country that would last well after his death and survive all the way up to the modern day. After a decade-long siege of an entire valley, one might expect the king of Nepal to sit peaceful for a time while his people and the newly introduced people of the Kathmandu Valley, some without ears and noses, recuperated. The capture of Kathmandu only appeared to make Prithvi Narayan Shah even hungrier to unite more land into the newly created Nepal. To command his armies, he again sought help from his one-eyed brother, Surpratap Shah. The war-weary prince had seen too much warfare, however, even with only one eye and declined the order of his older brother. An argument broke out between the two and the king Prithvi of Nepal exiled him to his westernmost territory of Tanahun. Eventually, Prithvi Narayan Shah would order for his execution as his generalship and displeasure at him made him a danger to Prithvi. The Limbuan Nepalese war would break out on August 29th of 1771 as two Nepalese armies invaded Limbuan one from the north of Nepal and the other approaching from the south. The northern army was led by a Gokali noble named Ram Krishna Kunwa, a man whose descendants would go on to give the Shah rulers of Nepal headache after headache. The southern army of Nepal was under the command of Abhiman Singh Basniat, the son of Shiravam Singh Basniat, who was Prithvi Narayan Shah's first lead commander of his armies. As 1771 bled into 1772, the war continued on a slow trajectory, the forces of Nepal being blockaded by mountainous terrain and a dry high elevation humidity. The outnumbered Limbuan forces held out for a total of three years before coming to the negotiating table of Prithvi Narayan Shah. The following peace deal called the Treaty of Salt and Water annexed nearly half of the Limbuan land but in return recognized the kings of Limbuan to be on equal footing with the kings of Nepal, ensuring their safety from Nepal for at least the time being. Shortly after the conclusion of the Limbuan Nepalese war, King Prithvi Narayan Shah would develop a serious illness. 
When it became clear that he would not survive much longer, Prithvi decided to call for a grand council of his sons, brothers, priests, advisors and generals. In this council, Prithvi would relay messages for the future kings of Nepal to follow closely in order not to undo the nation he had just created. These messages to future generations would be written down and compiled into the Divyopadesh or the Divine Teachings. These messages included words on the fragile world position that Nepal was in. Prithvi called Nepal a yam between two boulders, referring to Nepal's position located between the Qing dynasty and the ever-growing British East India Company. Prithvi suggested to always remain close to the Chinese while ignoring the British as much as possible. He also told future generations of Nepalese to embrace Nepal as the new Hindustan, as most of India had fallen under the rule of the British or the Muslim rulers of the Mughal Empire. On his 52nd birthday, January 11th of 1775, Prithvi Narayan Shah would die from his prolonged illness in the city of Devirat, his body being burned on a huge funeral pyre. As Hindu tradition permitted, his four wives committed ritual suicide called Sati, throwing themselves onto the pyre to burn alongside their dead husband. Their ashes were then spread by his son, who would succeed him, Pratap Singh Shaha. Although he died young, the reign of Prithvi Narayan was followed with more ups and downs than a roller coaster. The man was beaten by his opponents almost as much as he defeated them. This would dismay a weaker man, but Prithvi learned from his mistakes and eventually compounded his hard-fought victories into triumphal campaigns. The last king of Gorkha and the first king of Nepal was a fair ruler who listened to the complaints of his people, while at the same time he was all too eager to show what happened if he was trifled with. Without Prithvi Narayan Shah's unification campaign, there is likely to have not been a modern Nepal, earning him the praise of the many Nepalese who consider him to be the father of their nation.